Okay, now I want to switch over and talk about bonding now that we know what metals and nonmetals are. Um, I want to talk first at several levels about ionic compounds because in some ways they're simpler. Um, surprisingly enough, ionic compounds are made up of ions. Charged particles formed when an atom gains or loses electrons. Various atoms uh, gain or lose various numbers of electrons. And one of the things that we're going to need to do is to, first of all, recognize that uh, ionic compounds are typically formed when a metal reacts with a nonmetal. If I put up a formula and I ask you, is it an ionic compound or not, you should look to see whether it's made up of a metal and a nonmetal. If it is, chances are good, it's an ionic compound. So that's the first thing to pick up off this slide and, and remember. Uh, metals characteristically lose one or more electrons when they form ionic compounds. Okay, so a metal might lose one electron if it were sodium, two electrons if it were calcium, three electrons if it were aluminum, for example. Uh, and in this process, it becomes a positively charged ion. We have a typical name for these. They are called cations. Please, not cation. Okay? Uh, there, there must be some high school teachers out there who don't have a clue about names or something. But uh, this is a cation. And if the, non, if the atom, uh, typically nonmetal atoms, gain electrons, lost by the metals in this case, they become anions. No, not anions, anions. These are negatively charged ions. Okay. Now, implicit in these statements are that in the formation of the compound, since the metal loses some electrons, the nonmetals are going to gain those electrons. No electrons are going to get lost and go off into the ether somewhere. Okay. Uh, so there'll be a balance between the number of electrons lost by the metal and those gained by the nonmetal within the formula for that compound. So we'll come back to that. Uh, in that regard, then, it's not surprising to find that uh, ionic compounds always contain equal numbers of positive and negative charges. They may not contain equal numbers of ions, but they will contain equal numbers of positive and negative charges, meaning the formula of the ionic compound whatever that is, NaCl, uh, uh, could be calcium bromide, CaBr2, uh, will be neutral. It won't have any charge on it overall. The positive charges will balance the negative charges, so it will be neutral. Uh, and this means it will have a zero net charge. All of its positive charges will be canceled exactly by all of its negative charges. So a little grain of table salt consists of sodium chloride formulas, and each sodium chloride formula has a sodium cation and a chloride anion in it. And since there are equal numbers of ions, equal numbers of charges, there's a zero net charge on that table salt. Okay. <clears throat> so we come to a question. How is it that we're going to find out what number of electrons an atom will lose or gain when it forms a monatomic ion? The answer to that is twofold. In some cases, we'll simply have to memorize the um, charge on the ion that it forms. And we'll do some of that. Um, in other cases, especially for main group metals and some main group nonmetals, uh, we will be able to predict it from the, using the periodic table. So I want to focus on that for a while. Uh, without saying why, I just want to tell you that frequently main group metal and nonmetal ions form with the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. Here, is the, uh, here are the noble gases from uh, the column 8A in the periodic table, family if you wish, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. Um, and what I'm saying here is that if you look at where an element is, a main group element, with respect to group 8A, you can predict 
how many positive or negative charges it forms. So if we look, for example, at fluorine, uh, fluorine is just to the left in the periodic table uh, uh, f from neon. So that means it has, uh, neon has Z is equal to 10, 10 protons, 10 electrons, and fluorine has nine protons and nine electrons. So in order to get from uh, the fluorine atom to the ion, the negative ion that it forms, it's a nonmetal, so it's going to gain one electron. When it gains one electron, it'll have 10, just like neon. On the other hand, if we look at lithium, lithium is one step beyond helium. Helium is Z is equal to 2, lithium is Z is equal to 3, and beryllium Z is equal to 4. So the quickest way that lithium can lose or gain electrons to get to a helium uh, number of electrons in helium, which is 2, is to lose one. So if it loses one, that will mean lithium's ion will be lithium 1 plus. So we predict the charge. Uh, magnesium down here is two steps from neon, so we would predict that it would form two positive charges in this process of losing two electrons. On the other side, as I said, fluorine and chlorine and bromine and iodine need one electron to get to an 8A uh, number, uh, so they will form anions with a single negative charge. Oxygen is two steps away from neon, so it will form an ion with two negative charges. And nitrogen is three steps away, so it will form an ion with three negative charges. Uh, now you don't go much beyond there because uh, plus three or minus three is about as large a charge as an ion, as an ion can have and be stable. So you don't have to worry too much about anything outside of minus three or plus three. Questions on this observation? Okay, so this is a handy tool to predict. If I ask you uh, what kind of, what is the charge on whatever ion sulfur forms, you would find sulfur in 6A and you say, well, he said go to the nearest noble gas, that's argon, it's two steps away, so you would predict sulfur would form two negative charges. Okay, we'll be talking about that uh, ion some more today. Okay. So let's do a problem. If you have that in mind, uh, let's do this problem. What monatomic ions do the elements below form? What's monatomic mean? One based on one atom. Okay, so iodine, Z is equal to 53, we'll trace it down here, and there it is right there. Z is equal to 53, iodine, it's in group 7A, and therefore um, we would expect it to gain one electron to get to the xenon uh, number here, 53 going to 54, so we would predict that iodine formed I with one minus, which can be written either I as a single minus or I one minus. Both of those are workable. Okay? Strontium, Z is equal to 38. Here's strontium down here. It's in group 2A. The nearest noble gas is step backwards two times to get to krypton here. So stepping backwards means strontium will form a dication. Now it's a metal, so you'd expect it to form a cation, and it's a dication uh, because it's two steps to the nearest noble gas. So that's what the strontium ion looks like. And aluminum is Z is equal to 13, it's right here, and it could either go forward, one, two, three, four, five steps to argon, or backwards, one, two, three, four steps to neon. It wants to go the shortest route, so if it does that, it, gain, it loses one, two, three electrons, so it becomes aluminum three plus. Now, if you remember that metals don't form stable negative ions, uh, that will help you pick these things out. Does anybody have a question on the choice of the charges on main group ions? Yes. 
Okay, aluminum is Z is equal to 13, and uh, it's a metal, so we expect it to lose electrons. Losing electrons, we need to get to the nearest noble gas. Z is equal to 13. We have a noble gas at 10 and a noble gas at 18. The one at 10 is closer, so we would expect it to go back. Aluminum, uh, 13 to 12, 12 to 11, 11 to 10. That's three steps, so three positive charges. You're welcome. Other questions on this? You're always going to have the periodic table to work with, so I strongly recommend this to you as a good tool for picking out the charges. Now, why do we need the charges? Because in a little while, we're going to use the charges to figure out the formulas. Okay, let's talk a little bit about covalent compounds to start with, uh, or before we do the rest of the ionic compounds. Uh, the essential characteristic of covalent compounds is that the atoms bond together by sharing pairs of electrons. Uh, in the simplest case, for H2, we would have two protons, which, uh, when they're widely separated, just behave as protons. One uh, proton, I'm sorry, two hydrogen atoms, one proton and one electron in each one. No interaction. As they get closer together, the electrons for one atom become attracted to the protons of the other, and uh, we eventually reach a spot where there are one, two, three, four Coulombic attractions and one, two repulsions. So there's a combination of forces that holds a covalent bond together. This usually occurs by or between nonmetals. In the simplest case, would be or two hydrogen atoms forming an H2 molecule. Now, four attractions overcome two repulsions. And the difference between the two will be the net force that's holding this combination together. And this is H2. Uh, and H2 is uh, represented in different ways. We can write a simple formula like this. We can put the pair of electrons in with electron dot notation like this. We could just put in a line for that pair of electrons. Or we can write a ball and stick model or a space filling model. But the upshot of this whole thing is that hydrogen appears as a diatomic molecule. It does not appear normally as hydrogen atoms. It, its behavior, if you were driving a hydrogen powered car, you would put H2 into it, not H into it. H might get formed somewhere in the process, but the, uh, the gas, the delivery of the fuel for that would be the H2 gas. Now, it's important to recognize that once a molecule like this, a covalently bonded molecule is formed, it doesn't behave like its component atoms anymore. It behaves like the molecule. The molecule will have different properties than the independent atoms. Now, incidentally, there are six other stable diatomic molecules besides H2. N2O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, and I2. Those are the famous seven, the seven famous diatomics, and you should memorize them um, as soon as you can. Because if you run into a problem that says chlorine reacts with dimethyl chicken wire uh, to give some product, uh, you'll have to know that that chlorine comes as Cl2. Otherwise, you won't be able to balance the equation. So, learn that. 